Well, we're in the first 12 verses of James, and James is going to talk about suffering. And that's what he said in verse 2. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. And I want you to notice there's a lot going on there, but he starts with when you face trials. And what he's showing you there is that trials are inevitable. Difficult moments are coming in your life, and the believers, the brothers in Jesus, are not exempt from this. Jesus said to his disciples, in this world, you will have trouble. The apostle Paul said it, through much tribulation, we will enter the kingdom. That pain is coming, and that anyone who thinks that believers in Jesus should be exempt from that has not read their Bible. Difficult moments are coming in your life, and they will be challenging enough that James calls them a test of your faith. They will even challenge what you believe. And yet it's interesting, James doesn't say what Paul does. Paul, or excuse me, Peter. Peter says, don't be surprised at this fiery ordeal as if something strange is happening to you. Peter says, trials are coming, and you should expect it. James goes further than that and says, trials are coming, and I want you to not just expect it, I want you to rejoice when they come. I want the arrival of pain to be a cause of praise in your life. I want you to celebrate. And then not only does he say that craziness, he doesn't just say when a trial comes, like a singular trial, like your latte is too cold or you get laid off at work or she breaks up with you. He says trials, plural. I want you to rejoice when many trials come. When an onslaught of drama arrives, celebrate. And then he doesn't just say meet trials or face trials. He uses the verb that means to fall and be surrounded by, to fall into the midst of. It's used two other places in the New Testament. One is of a man who fell into the midst of robbers who surrounded him and beat him to death. And then, or near death. And then there was another passage where it's a boat falls into the midst of a place where two currents collide and it rips the boat apart. And that's the verb James chooses. I want you to celebrate when you fall and are surrounded by all kinds of pain. And then not only does he say all kinds of pain, he says multicolored. That's the word he used to describe him. I want you to celebrate when you're surrounded by just a wide variety of painful situations, just various shades of aggravation and hues of drama. When you're surrounded by a cornucopia of pain, I want you to celebrate. So not just when your latte is too cold, not just when you lose your job, not just when she breaks up with you. He says, I want you to celebrate while you're drinking a latte that's too cold and you find out you've been laid off. And as they usher you out of the building holding that box, your phone buzzes and she's saying, we need to talk, it's over. And while you're reading that, you get hit by a bus. <laughs> James is saying, as you lay there bleeding, you should think, you know what? This is a good thing. This is actually, this is actually great. This is great. Now, I'm joking right now because you have to. It's some of this, right? You got to laugh to keep from crying sometimes. But, but James is talking about real pain. And as you read later in the book, he's going to say some of the pain they're experiencing. For some of them, it's poverty of a complete financial crisis. For others, it's persecution because of their faith. Or for others, it's because of physical illness that's lingering and won't go away. So James is saying this to real people who are going through real life pain. And this is about you too. Some of you, the stress of your job has cost you your joy and is costing you physically. Some of you, there are family difficulties that are not easily untangled. Some of you, there's lingering physical illness and it's not going to get solved soon. And the daily pain is just grinding away at your joy. And James says, in the middle of all that pain, I want you to rejoice. I want you to rejoice. And I think a fair question to ask is why? Like, seriously, why? Like, who does that? And this is the point, if we're honest, where some of you read the Bible and you go, see, this is why this book is so dumb. I mean, seriously, who does that? Who celebrates when they're in pain? Well, two kinds of people. Number one is crazy people. And that's what some of you are like, see, that's the thing, this book's nuts. Like, who celebrates in pain? People who also think they're Napoleon or that they're a coffee mug also go, man, it's fun to get a beating. It's crazy. But I would submit there's a second kind of person that can rejoice in the midst of pain, and that is someone who knows something. Not someone who's out of touch with reality, but someone who's in touch with a deeper reality. That they understand that there's potential locked up in their pain. 
that though this situation's uncomfortable, something about it could produce something great. And that great experience is so desirable, I'm thrilled to see it, and my thrill doesn't stay locked up in the future. It comes cascading back even into the present moment of pain. Example would be Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> Darth Vader, as you recall, was recently trotted back out for one of the new Star Wars movies. And you remember as he was attacking the little guys in funny helmets with his lightsaber? What did they do? What you would expect when you get hit by a lightsaber. They just screamed, right? And yet the first person who ever got hit by one was Serene, was he not? Do you remember? Obi-Wan just lowered his and let Darth Vader hit him. And you go, who does that? Who welcomes a hit from a lightsaber? Was he nuts? No. What did Obi-Wan say? Strike me down and I will become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. He knew, though this is about to hurt, it's producing something great. And the peace of that greatness, I'm going to be blue, get to go anywhere I want. It doesn't stay locked up in the future. I can be peaceful now, even when I'm getting hit. Working out is like this. You'll see what happens when you work out. You're putting your muscle in crisis. You're putting it in pain. Why are you doing that? Because you know as your body's forced to respond, it will grill, build greater strength. You'll get the physique you want, and you'll go, oh, I'm going to look fantastic in the mirror. My clothes will fit better. And that joy, that certainty that you're going to look better as a result of this moment brings you joy, and not just future joy. You'll hear guys in the gym go, oh, yeah, that burn is good. No, it is not. It is painful. <laughs> but you are so certain that burning is creating something good, you're rejoicing in that, and the joy doesn't stay locked up in the future. It comes cascading even to the present. And so, yes, you're rejoicing even while you're in pain. Do you see it? So here's the question. What are we called to be? Nut jobs who think pain is fun or people who know something about the pain, that there's potential within it? Look at verse 3. For you know, we know something, that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. We can rejoice when difficulty surrounds us because we know that it has potential locked within it, that God uses these things. We can know God has purpose in our problems, that something positive can be produced by our pain. That's the perspective of James. Our pain has purpose under God's sovereign care, and so we can praise. We can praise God legitimately in the midst of our problems because we know he has purpose in the pain. And James will give us two purposes. The first one is that God uses pain to produce perseverance. That testing of your faith produces steadfastness or perseverance. It's the Greek word hupomone. Hupo means under and mone means to abide. That says God will put you in a crisis moment, but it's not to break you down. It's to actually to build strength into you so you can abide, live, flourish, even under greater weights. It's like working out. You lift progressively heavier weights. Why? Because it forces your muscles to grow so you can lift heavier weights, so you can go further, you can go faster. That crisis has a great cause. That pain has a purpose. It's building into you perseverance, the ability to be strong and fast and abide even under great weight. And that's what James says pain will do for you. Pain is an instrument in God's hand to sow into you perseverance, to put something good in you. You see it in your education. My kids, just maybe a year or two ago, learning the entire alphabet sounded horrendous. 26 letters? You monsters! And as they wrote them out, their little hands, they were like, I can't, I can't do it. Ah! But we kept putting them in situations every day where they had to learn the alphabet and spell words and sound it out. And now what happened? We put them in that difficult situation to torture them? No, to produce in them something good that they can abide in that learning and now they can read bigger and bigger books. They can last longer. It happens theologically that you maybe had a, a very infant faith and someone just came to you with a single question about God, and it wrecked your faith. I remember me in college, I was like, well, surely the Gospels were written by the disciples. And then I found out Luke wasn't a disciple. And then I'm like, then who even is this man? And my faith just began to crumble. And I was like, I'm believing a lie. And I had to 
start getting answers. And as I dwelt in that pain, I learned more about the Bible. And not only did I just get my confidence back, I became stronger in my knowledge of the Bible, stronger in my faith, that God put me in crisis not to crush me but to build me. That's what a good parent does. That's what a good teacher does. I'm going to put you in pain but for a purpose, not to destroy you but to build you, to sow into you perseverance, the ability to abide even under greater weight. There's purpose in your pain today. That's what he's trying to say here. God will use it for great purposes if you allow him. He uses this test of faith. That testing carries the idea of a refiner's fire. He's assuming you have faith. This is someone who trusts God, believes God's guiding their story. And that faith is put into a fire. Why? To purify it, to make it better than it is now. And so God will do that with your life. And if you understand that, you can have joy even in the pain. I remember for me, growing up, my dad lived in Beeville, Texas. Going out to see him every other weekend was not always the easiest thing for me. My dad's a good guy um, in a lot of ways, but that was a difficult space for me. It was the world of men that, for me as a little kid, I did not feel like I fit easily into. And yet, fast forward decades later as an adult, I remember I was visiting a guy that was supporting our ministry, and he uh, ran 44 farms, one of the largest cattle operations in Texas. And I went out there, and it was cow paradise. It was maybe human paradise, but if you're a cow, you're like, wow, as far as the eye can see, rolling hills of lush grass. And all the bulls had their own pens, just their personal space, but could also run free. And I'm like, this is amazing. And then he showed me the barn where they get some privacy so they can make babies. And you're like, oh, look at that. And he was showing me. And I remember at one point I told him, this must be the best place for a cow to grow up. And he said, oh, we don't let them grow up here. I was like, what? Why not? This place is magic. And he said, yes, but what we discovered was if cows just grew up here where it's easy, where the turf is so soft, they have weak hooves. And so as the minute they're sold and they step on a rock, it splits their foot in half and it destroys them. He said, so for their good, we ship them off to Beeville. And I said, say what? And he said, yes, for their good, we ship them off when they're young to Beeville because it's in the harshness of that terrain they get some of the perseverance and strength that they need. And I remember as he say that, said that, my entire life flashed before my eyes. I was like, that's why you send them to Beeville? And he's like, yeah, man, are you okay? Are you crying? I'm like, it's just a good story, Bob. I mean, just give me a second. Wow, it makes so much sense that maybe God has a purpose in the pain even when we can't see it. That if you believe he's a good dad, he uses pain for a purpose to sow into you perseverance, to make you stronger than you are now. And so many of us hear this and we understand that and you go, wow, that's really great. And I could end the sermon here. And so God's putting you in hardship to make you a stronger person. So endure that pain because he's making you tougher. And yet some of you that are more philosophically bent go, Ben, that sounds great, but the logic breaks down. You're like, God wants to make you stronger. Why? So he can put you in more difficult situations. Take a beating. Why? So you can take bigger beatings. Well, hallelujah. Bring out the band. Let's worship. This is great. There's got to be more than that. And there is. And that's why James says in verse 4, And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. God will put you in that difficult situation to breathe into you perseverance, that you can endure it. But that's not the whole reason he does it. He wants you to endure it because in the enduring of pain, he begins to do something. He uses that pain to perfect you. He uses that pain to add to you. If you let steadfastness complete its work, and that's fascinating because the implication is you could not. You could be going through pain right now and not learn a thing. And some of you feel that way. Hey, Ben, my circumstances aren't making me better. They're making me bitter. They're making me doubt God. They're not strengthening my faith. They've unraveled it. Well, let me tell you something. God puts you in this pain, and if you let steadfastness complete its work, it's going to perfect you. It's going to do good in you. And let me just say, by side note, this is what happened to your heroes. I don't even know who all your heroes are, but think about who they are. Most of them, I would guess, are people who went through incredible difficulty, and rather than being destroyed by it, they were improved by it. 
They got tougher skin and a softer heart. They got greater vision and they got greater trust. Pain has potential locked into it to make you someone who can be used for great purpose. If you let it, let steadfastness have its full effect. Why? So that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. I love that because he plays on words. Let steadfastness complete or teleos its work so that you can be teleos. You can be perfect. Let steadfastness complete its work so you can be complete. And he says that you can be complete, lacking in nothing. What he's saying there by using those words perfect and complete, he's saying there's some things in you and that word perfect can be translated mature. It doesn't mean you're sinless, but it means that there's a maturing in you. There's good things in you, but they need to be matured. And then complete means, and there are other skills and understandings you don't have at all, and they need to be added to you. So James is saying, God will put you in pain so that he can perfect what you do had and then supply what you don't so you can be a more complete human being for God's purposes in your life. That's what God does. Fills up what's lacking and adds what you miss so you can be complete. A great physical example would be MMA, mixed martial arts. New sport, lots of popularity. What's happening? There's a mixing of martial arts, all different groups getting together. But guys always come with one thing they're really good at. And so you may have a guy that's a great boxer. He's in there, and he knows how to throw a jab and knock your lights out. And so he gets into that moment, and what happens? One of the best things that can happen to a fighter is to lose. Did they get in that moment, and suddenly... Click, lights turn out, they wake up later, thought they were on a fishing trip, someone has to explain to them, now you got knocked out by a big scary guy, and they're like, oh my God, that's so incredible, and you're like, I know, it's really scary. But then as they kind of get over the emotional damage, they begin to look at what went wrong. And if they have a good trainer, that trainer will say, you're a good boxer, but it needs to mature. You're like a level six, and that guy was a level eight. So let me use this painful moment to train you. Let's get you back in the gym. Let's get you back in the crucible. Let's get you in training to make your punches sharper and crisper and faster and your footwork better. Let's improve what you already have. But there's also a skill called grappling you don't have at all. And that's why the guy picked you up and spun you in circles and threw you out of the ring and it was a little embarrassing because you had no idea what to do. And so you got to decide, strengthen boxing, but also learn grappling. I'm going to mature what you have and add what you won't. So you can be, what they say, a complete fighter. You can handle any situation. You can handle any bully because I've added to you what you lack. That's what James is saying God wants to do for you. God is looking at you and he's going to put you in pain. Why? Because that difficulty shows you your deficiencies. You'll get into a moment where you go, I don't have the skills for this moment. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to perceive this moment and I don't know how to handle it. Will God put you in situations you don't know how to handle? Yes, all the time. You hear people say that. God will never give you something you can't handle. Yes, he will. He will frequently do that to you and you will freak out because you will be at the complete limits of your knowledge. But at that moment, if you let steadfastness finish its work, he's doing that not to hurt you, but to help you, to add to you what you lack, to make you a stronger person. There was a book I read years ago, Crazy for the Storm. It was about this kid that his dad would frequently put him in overwhelming circumstances, make him go surfing in big waves as a little kid. And the kid would be out there in the strength of the ocean and be completely overwhelmed. Ah, like the little kid can't handle it. But dad was there holding him, helping him acclimate. This is the strength and chaos of nature. Now here's a surfboard. Here's how to navigate it so you can ride through and even leverage these circumstances for your joy. Then he would take him skiing and he would put him up on a huge mountain. And this little like five-year-old's like, you gotta be kidding. He's like, it's crazy, right? Let's go. And his dad would put him in an overwhelming moment, not to crush him, but to create a crisis moment of opportunity to show him this is the overwhelming power of nature. And yet here's a way you can navigate it, not only to be successful, but to thrive and maybe even enjoy it. And his dad would put him in these overwhelming circumstances to show him his deficiencies, and then he would mature and add to him a skill set that he needed. And so when he got older, and by older I mean like 13, he was in a plane crash on the side of a mountain in a blizzard, and everyone on board died, even his dad. And as this injured kid began to walk through a blizzard down the snow, that was a situation that would kill most people. But what he discovered and what he wrote about in the book was, my dad, by putting me in these situations and being near me, sewed into me the skills I needed to survive 
and thrive. And he made it down that mountain alive because his dad put him in crisis for a beautiful cause. That pain served the purpose, not to just give him perseverance, but to give him what he lacked so he could succeed in life. And that's what your heavenly father will do to you. He's a good dad. I'm gonna take you outside your depth, not to terrify you, but to teach you if you'll let me. God uses pain for perseverance. He'll use a difficulty to expose your deficiency. And the good news is that wounding opens the door for wisdom. That's where he goes next. He says, so you'll be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. And then James tells you what you're lacking. And if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God and he will give generously to all without reproach. He says, God's gonna put you in a place where you lack wisdom. Wisdom is understanding how the world works and how to work within it. That you'll get into a place where you go, I don't know how to navigate this. I've never been in this space relationally. I've never had an aging parent. I've never raised a kid. I've never dealt with this relationship. I've never had this kind of job pressure. I'm completely out of my depth. I don't know how to understand the situation and I certainly don't know how to navigate it successfully. God will put you in situations where you go, I'm out of my depth. And in that moment, you have a response. You could not let steadfastness complete its work. And how would you do that? Pout, cry, get mad at God for not bending reality to your will. Well, if I was king, I would do it like this and tell God what's what and you won't learn a thing. Or you can come in humility and say, I don't understand. I need help. Somebody teach me. And humility is the key that opens the door to clarity. If anyone lacks wisdom, ask God. And then he defines God, God who gives generously. That word can also be translated singly, a God who is not duplicitous in heart. When you come to him and say, I don't know how to do this, he says, I know, I put you here, let me teach you. Let me show you not just how to survive it, but how to surf it. Let me give you what you need to, to survive and to thrive. Let me teach you. And he says, and I will give single-mindedly to you and I will not reproach you. God will not shame you for not having the answers. He put you there on purpose. He will not shame you for struggling. If you're in here saying, there's so much about life I don't understand, there's so much about God I don't understand, welcome. And the path of wisdom begins by saying, I'm not wise. I don't know. Someone teach me. Someone help me. And God is willing to do that. All he's looking for is sincerity in the search. And when you realize that, he takes me out of my depth, not to destroy me, but to develop me, you can have joy even in the midst of the pain. I remember talking with a guy that was going through SQT, a SEAL qualification training to become a Navy SEAL. And as he was going through it, we would talk on the phone on the weekends, just how's it going? These rigorous tests they're putting you through that a lot of people are quitting and washing out. And he says, you know what, Ben? We just went through a test this week that was nuts. I was like, tell me about it. And he said, well... They put us next to a swimming pool and we laid with our feet away from the pool and our heads kind of on the edge of the pool sort of leaning off and we were all in a row together and they took our diving masks and they filled them with water and then put them on our faces, covering our face with water. And then we had to clear our mask of water. I said, how do you do that? And he was like, well, the secret is to relax and the water drains into your nose, drains down the back of your throat into your stomach and if you relax, the water drains down your nose into your stomach and it clears your mask. I was like, what happens if you don't relax? He says, oh, your gag reflex kicks in and you instantly vomit. I was like, did that happen? He was like, oh yeah. He's like, the guys that left and lied to me instantly were like, blah, blah, blah. he's like, so we were just in a pool of vomit right away. He said, but the crazy thing is, if you do relax in the middle of that moment, the water does drain down and you clear your mask. And as he was telling me this moment, I just remember saying, dude, is this like, the worst thing you've ever been through in your life? And I remember he said, no, it's awesome. And I said, you want to explain to me how laying in a pool of vomit, sucking water down your nose is considered awesome? Because you lost me. And I'll never forget his response. He said, it's awesome because I know these instructors are not wasting my time. He said, they're not just doing this to be sadistic. They know I'm about to be sent on a mission and I may have to get there through the water. And in that mission, a bomb may go off, an attack may occur where all my gear is thrown off. And I have to have the ability within myself to stay calm, retrieve my mask, 
put it on, clear the water to survive, and then to continue in my mission. He says, so I know they're putting me in this pain, not to break me, but to build me. They're sowing into me the skill set I need to accomplish my purposes. And so I think it's awesome. And I love that. It was his confidence in his instructors that led him to praise, even in the middle of the pain. And it's the same with you and me. How can you worship even in the midst of your wounding? It's when you have confidence. I have a king who loves me. My instructor has put me in this crisis, not to crush me, but to teach me. And as I trust him, he will build me so I can praise even in the midst of the pain. Do you see it? That's what he does. And yet he requires a sincerity to the search. And that's the next part where he says, let him ask in faith with no doubting. The one who doubts is like a wave. See, that's driven and tossed by the wind. That person must not suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. I remember when I first read that, I was like, well, then that counts me out because sometimes I struggle. God, I want to believe you're going to meet me in the struggle. I want to believe you're going to help me parent better. I want to believe you're going to help me navigate this relational conflict with my roommate. But I don't know if you'll help me. Maybe you don't even exist. I don't even know. So I guess I automatically doesn't count for me because James says I have to never waver and never doubt and just go forward with a stoic face and a broad smile. Like I can't do it. But James isn't saying you can never struggle. That's why he says God gives without reproach. God's not going to judge you for struggling. What God wants is the sincerity in the search. He literally says that you wouldn't be double-minded. He uses the word two-souled, which commentators all agree is the first time that word ever shows up in Greek literature. James made it up. But he's saying you have two souls, two passions, two desires. I'm going to trust God today and do things his way, but if it's not working out tomorrow, I'm going for mine. I'm going to trust what he says about how to navigate relationships. Unless it's not working, then I'm going to go off. I'm going to trust him to provide for me, but if I get a chance to cheat to get ahead, hey, that's just how business gets done around here. And so I'll trust God and the world and see how it goes. He says, you shouldn't expect anything because you're unstable in all your ways. You're trying to walk down two paths and you can't do that. Struggle on the journey, but don't try to straddle two journeys. God's not going to help you with that. And we know that's true. That's true in diets. If you say, I need to renovate my health, I'm going to do the whole 30. But here's the thing. I'm going to do whole 30 on Mondays. But on Tuesdays, it's Taco Tuesday. And I love tacos. So whole 30 is going on hold on Tuesdays, okay? And then on Wednesday, I'm back in it until lunch because there's a, like this vending machine by my office that has the king size Snickers. And those are good. And then I'm going to get back on it on Thursday. But then it's Friday. And you, guess what? It's not going to go well for you. And if you look and go, like, man, this whole 30 doesn't work. No, you don't work. <laughs> you are duplicitous, expect nothing. Do you see it? Same with dating. You can't tell a girl, hey, I want to date you, but I'm also going to date six or seven other people. So I want to pursue intimacy with you, but I also need to keep the field open, right? If you have self-respect, you're like, no, no. You either walk down the path with me towards greater intimacy, or you walk towards a different path, but you don't get both. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, I want to challenge you in the middle of your pain to press into me. And I want to challenge you with that. God is open about the fact that life's not easy. I want to challenge you at the back end of 2019. Lean into his word. Struggle well with us. Just make that decision. I'm going to keep coming back to church. I'm going to show up at community group. I'm going to get one of these books and read it. Even though six out of seven days, I may say, well, I don't understand that. Amen. And then shut it. Maybe on day seven, there'll be a breakthrough where you'll understand it. And he'll deepen your knowledge if you don't give up. If you stay committed, you got to stay on the course and he'll teach you. I remember for me, same seal buddy brought me to his water O course. It was an obstacle course that was a series of ropes hanging over an Olympic-sized swimming pool. So the way the obstacle course worked is you basically just use your forearm strength to navigate ropes until your hands give out and you plummet uh, into failure. But the way it starts is you get up on the high dive and there's a rope and you swing on that rope onto a cargo net. And I remember as I got to that, he was like, hey man, you just got to know the way the mechanics work, the way the rope's situated. If you try to Tarzan swing, you're just going to hit the water. You're not going to hit the cargo net. I'm like, okay. He's like, yeah, there's only one way to make it to the net. What you got to do is as soon as you jump off the high dive, you got to loop your legs around the rope so you'll be swinging backwards and upside down. But what will happen is as the rope hits 
its crescendo, you will just naturally rise onto the top of it and then release and your momentum will set you into the cargo net. And I was like, got it. Okay, sounds good. And so I remember I got up there onto the high dive and grabbed the rope. And as I'm like 15 feet in the air, I was like, I'm going to throw my head back. No, no, no. I'm going to hit this board with the back of my head and black out at the bottom of the pool. You're going to have to fish me out. I'm not doing that. And swing backwards, are you nuts? And so I remember I was like, there's no way, man. And so I was looking at it. I was like, you know what? Maybe if I pick up my knees, if I just kind of squinch up on the rope, I'm going to get this done. And so I just kind of did it Ben's way. Slash, hit the water. And honestly, for a minute, I couldn't understand it. I was like, I don't understand how that didn't work. And then it struck me, you know what? I'm at the Navy SEAL obstacle course. Maybe I should listen to the Navy SEAL, <laughs> even though it sounds a little crazy. And I remember I got up there the next time, and I tried it. I was like, this is nuts. But I jumped off, threw my legs up over the rope, was swinging backwards and upside down. And sure enough, as the rope kind of spun around, I'm on top of this rope. And as I come up, I see the net in front of me, and I was like, no way. And as I let go, the momentum threw me into the rope or net, and I grabbed it. And I remember hanging up there going, did you see me? Did you see what I just did? But I had to commit to the plan if I wanted to proceed. And that's what James is saying. Commit to it. Commit to it. Go on a journey. Decide with the rest of 2019, I'm going to take this book seriously like it actually is the Word of God. That I'm not going to tell God, no, God, you don't understand how it plays out in 2019. No, I'm going to say maybe he knows more about my life than I do. And maybe I want to learn what he says about how to navigate life. And I want to trust him. I'm not going to be duplicitous. I'm going to walk with him. And as I walk with him, he will give me wisdom. Now, what wisdom will he give you? Let me give you two pieces of wisdom that pain provides, and then we'll close, right? He will give you the wisdom to loosen your grip and the wisdom to lift your gaze. That's the piece of wisdom that pain will bring you, to loosen your grip and to lift your gaze. What do I mean by loosen your grip? You see it in verse 9. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. Because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls, its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Some of you read that and you're like, why does he suddenly start talking about money in the midst of that? Because when we handle difficulty, we clutch to things for value. And a very natural thing to clutch to is money. Life may be hard, but my money gets me out of problems. And James says, be careful, rich man because you will fade like a flower and what you build can go away in a heartbeat. And so often God will introduce pain into your life to release your grip on things that will fade. Some of us right now, our greatest comforts come from things that are transient and pain will expose where you are trying to make a temporal thing carry the eternal weight of your soul. So let me ask you this question, ladies. You're beautiful. Is your beauty of value to you or is it your everything? What would happen if you lost all of your hair? If it was gone tomorrow? Would you be discouraged or would you be devastated? If you are devastated, then you realize I've been putting a lot of significance on something that fades because beauty fades. Sylvester Stallone. He did a movie when he was rebooting his career where he went for a more character actor route. So he gained 40 pounds of pure fat by just eating wedding cakes every day. And he said the weirdest thing happened. He said, it wasn't just that I was physically changing. I got more depressed, more anxious, more insecure. I didn't want to leave my house. And he said, it dawned on me. I didn't just enjoy working out. It was my source. And so when I lost my physical health, I didn't just lose my health, I lost me. And that situation exposed to him, you were putting the weight of your soul on something that fades. As a college minister, I saw this all the time. You would see some people show up at college and they were thrilled with a chance to start over. Because high school didn't go so good. And they are thrilled to college I even met some that changed their name. You found out later, my name is actually Sam. You're like, what? They just totally rebooted. Hard reset. But I would meet these other guys that, man, high school, they were awesome. They were the 
head of this committee. They were the leadership of this deal. As they were seniors, they walked along the halls and teachers feared them. The young wanted to be them. And they stood on the mountain of their accomplishments in their letter jacket with their cute name. And they just pronounced from their kingdom, I've arrived. And then they start freshman year of college wearing the same letter jacket. Nobody cares, man. Nobody cares. And I would watch people that would bring on a full-blown existential crisis. If I didn't just lose the letter jacket, I lost me. And you go, well, thank God you're figuring this out at 18. You put the weight of your soul on a thing that will fade. And so often God will give us pain to show us, hey, your circumstance is temporary. Your money will not solve the biggest questions in your life and it can disappear in a heartbeat. And I have cried with men on the phone that all of their significance was in their money until 2008. And they lost it all. And I talked to some who lost their sense of self and their will to live. And I knew others that when all that swept away, they hit the solid bedrock of their faith and say, but I have an anchor in eternity that is firm and sure. And a faith in God became even more sturdy and more strong. Their faith grew. So one of the things he'll give you is a loosening your grip on things that fade. When I injured my back, I remember I hit the ground and there was a season where they weren't sure I'd be able to walk again. And I was trying to tell the doctor to hurry up and fix it. Hey man, our ministry launches in two weeks, so do whatever you gotta do. You gotta cut it open, just do it now. I'm ready, I'll bite the stick, go, go man. I was like, hurry up and fix it. And he was like, hey, reality doesn't bend to your schedule. And there's no easy fix to your problem. And you gotta be still. And as I laid there in that pain, I remember it dawned on me, I may not be able to walk. He told me in that hospital room, you may not be able to hold your baby daughter. And it dawned on me in that moment, there were things that a day before were so important that I realized really aren't important at all. I cared about some career and social media things that you go, that doesn't really matter. What really matters is my family, my trust in God with what he's doing in the world. And I remember as I laid on that floor, I started thinking about, God, will you do something about pain? And then I started thinking about the pain in the universe how the whole world is hemorrhaging in pain, how my pain as real as it was, wouldn't land in the top 10 of human pain on the planet right now. And I started praying, God, will you do something about all of this? And he was freeing me from the silly little things I was concerned about to ask the bigger questions of human suffering. Where is this all going? And I remember praying, God, will you do something? And I felt like he was saying, Ben, I have and I will. What did you think I was doing on that cross? when I took on pain voluntarily for you? And do you believe the promises I made that the one who is steadfast will receive a crown of life that God has promised to those who love him? And I started praying, thank you, God. I started worshiping in the middle of the pain and started praying, oh God, use me to help others know you and use my pain for your purpose however you want. He will teach you to let go of things you should not grip and he will teach you to lift your gaze to see what matters most. Blessed is the one who remains steadfast in that trial. Because when you do, you'll receive that crown of life. You'll receive eternal life that's promised not to those who work hard, but to those who love him, that put their hope in him. That God will introduce pain in your life for a purpose, to give you perseverance. And that perseverance has a purpose. It's perfect purpose is to expose your deficiencies through that difficulty. And in that deficiency, you're meant to cry out in humility, God, teach me. And he'll give you clarity on what really matters in life. And the more he gives you that, the more you'll see much of what I cared about in life fades. But there are some beautiful, eternal things that don't. And I want my life to be about those. So when I was a college minister, we did have a beautiful young woman in our ministry, get cancer. And as it grew and moved from her skin to her lymph nodes, to her brain and her lungs and her abdomen, 
She wrote this in her blog online. She said, I recently read a quote from Johnny Erickson in my Bible study. I said, if I could, I would take this wheelchair to heaven with me. If you don't know Johnny Erickson, she's a quadriplegic. And she said, if I could, I would take this wheelchair to heaven with me. And standing next to my Savior, Jesus Christ, I would say, Lord, do you see this wheelchair? Well, before you send it to hell, I want to tell you something about it. You were right when you said in this world we would have trouble. There's a lot of trouble being a quadriplegic. But you know what? The weaker I was in that thing, the harder I leaned on you. And the harder I leaned on you, the stronger I discovered you to be. Thank you for the bruising blessing. It was a severe mercy. Thank you. And our student wrote, wow. What if we all begin to view our suffering, be it physical, emotional, relational, as a bruising blessing, a severe mercy. Our scars, our wheelchairs, our bald heads, all reminding us of God's sovereignty. Yes, when we live our lives in complete submission to our creator, we can look at each and every scar as a sovereign, sanctifying scar, a scar that because of God's complete sovereignty and his ability and desire to rid us of our sin helps to lead us into the enjoyment of a right relationship with him. Therein lies the true blessing of being bruised. Each blessing is found amidst the deep, indescribable relationship that develops between you and God as you trust him. Lean on him, and he will turn your valley of trouble into a place of springs. Let me close with this. How can that not be wishful thinking? You hear it a lot in pop culture today. Something bad will happen to someone, and they'll go, well, you know, it's all for the best. Everything happens for a reason. And I'll hear people say that sometimes, and I want to ask them, whose reason? And what if that person's not good? And some of you may be asked that question. You go, what if my pain has no purpose? What if life is just cruel and horrible and then we die? Is this just a hollow, shallow platitude? Everything happens for a reason. Does it? How does that work? What's the basis for our confidence? That's where James points us. Release that which cannot hold you and look up because there is a crown of life promised to those who love him. James anchors our confidence in eternity. How does he do that? Because of what we talked about last week, that Jesus Christ came and he preached love. He preached peace. He preached blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who trust God. And then that beautiful teacher died a horrible death on the cross. And if that was the end, you would say, what was the point of that? Really sweet guy just got murdered, so life is horrible. But when he burst forth from that grave, he got to have the last word. And he said, guess what? I didn't just survive the pain of crucifixion. I used crucifixion for my cause. I used that pain for my purpose. I used death to accomplish my will. I used my pain to purchase you. The worst day in human history became the best day because I was taking your sin and nailing it to your Savior and I buried it in my grave and then when I left that grave, you can too. Now I'm going to sit at the right hand of the Father and all those who trust me and love me, you will sit there too and I can have confidence that my pain has purpose because his did. Because I have an exhibit A that my Savior did it. And so it's not just a hypothetical, I hope it's true. He said, I walked through the valley of the shadow of death and I came out the other side. So that you have confidence when you enter the valley of the shadow of death, you don't have to say pain is fun, but you can rejoice in that valley because you know my God uses pain for his purpose. He used Christ and he will use mine. And that empty grave testifies to the universe. Death is not my master, it is my servant. And pain does not own me, it works for him. And he harnesses 
purposes my pain for his purposes. So hallelujah, praise be to the one who set me free, that he was buried in that grave and rose on the third day. And that roaring lion set me free. Hallelujah to a God like that. So I can praise him even in the pain. That's where our hope comes in the fixed anchor, strong and secure in eternity because we have a hero who went there first and we can trust him with our lives. And the more we trust him, the stronger we'll find him to be. Lean into him and trust him even in the pain because he's good. He's a good dad. He's a good coach. And he uses pain for his purpose if you let him.